Hi, Bartonella Buds! We're getting really colloquial here. Buds instead of buddies. Welcome back to part three of three. After I tested positive on Galaxy's IFA serology panel, I started antibiotic therapy with my Bartonella literate medical doctor. But I figured, oh, I have an infectious disease, so I should see an infectious disease doctor. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. So I saw an infectious disease doctor's nurse practitioner, and she took a thorough history. And I told her that my worst symptoms are excruciating muscle and nerve pain, especially in my hands and feet, as well as an absurdly long list of intolerances to both food and medication. She examined my feet, and she told me that I had bony feet, especially on the ball of the foot, which had no relevance to my symptoms, considering that not only did I tell her that my entire foot hurt, but also that my entire body hurts. Also, this is my foot. Looks pretty normal to me. I told her that I had been taking 150 milligrams of rifampin to treat the bartonellosis, and she was like, never take rifampin by itself. Okay, maybe she wasn't that dramatic, but close, because bacteria can quickly become resistant to rifampin when used as a monotherapy, and you can find evidence of this in the scientific literature. She told me that she didn't think that Bartonella was the root of my symptoms, and that she would confer with the doctor and discuss with other doctors at an upcoming conference. At the very least, she treated me with respect and believed my pain, which should really be the bare minimum that all healthcare professionals should meet, but if you're a chronically ill patient, especially with a mysterious or un known illness, you know that many doctors do not reach what should be the floor. So many doctors are like subterranean. About a week later, she called me to say that she had discussed my case with many doctors, including doctors at Harvard, and none of them could think of an infectious etiology for my symptoms. I even tried to reason with her using her own mainstream medicine language, so to speak. So I told her that I read about Bartonellosis on UpToDate.com, and she interjected, I love UpToDate. And I said that UpToDate says a titer under 1 to 64 is negative, a titer of 1 to 256 or over, the patient should be treated, and in between, the patient should be retested. And even though she had just said, I love UpToDate, she didn't offer to retest me, which really pissed me off at the time. But in hindsight, it was actually for the best, because if she had retested me, she probably would have used a big lab like Questor LabCorp, and I probably would have tested negative, and I probably would have very much doubted my diagnosis of Bartonellosis. How do I know that if she had retested me, I probably would have suffered from this series of unfortunate events? Well, recently, I saw a new LLMD, Oh, I was gonna start saying BLMD. So I saw a new BLMD and she offered to test me through Quest and my insurance would cover it. So I said, why the hell not? And when it came back negative, I was sh 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 shocked. How can two IFA Bartonella tests in the same patient yield such different results? I always hear people say, oh, this lab is good because it found my Bartonella or this lab is bad because it didn't find my Bartonella. However, you can't really judge how good a test is based on whether it gave you the results that you were looking for. So I want you to know that the reason why I trust Galaxy and that I don't trust Quest for their Bartonella tests isn't because Galaxy gave me a positive and Quest gave me a negative. It's because the variation in sensitivities or true positives for IFA Bartonella tests range from 14%, which is pitiful, to 100%. Let's say a test has a sensitivity of 90%. This sounds pretty good, and generally it is. Out of 100 patients who definitely have Bartonella, the test will identify 90 of them. But for 10 of them who definitely have the disease, well, they're SOL. The sensitivity of an IFA test is influenced by several factors, including the antigen used, the cutoff titer used, and test procedures. Number one, the antigen is the toxin or foreign substance that's on the bacteria that the immune system responds to. In serological tests, the lab uses an antigen preparation to test a patient's antibody response. Okay, I'm asking Merriam-Webster. Agar. Agar. A gelatinous colloidal extract of red al alga. Algae. It says alga. Huh. Used especially in culture media or as an enchilling and stabilizing agent in food. Agar. Agar. Okay, let's ask you too. What exactly is agar agar and how do you use it? I'm going to tell you how to Agar. Now let's consult Google. Agar. Agar. So now we have auger, agar, and agar. I wanted to say agar. I'm going to say agar. Depending on how the antigen is prepared, this can affect IFA results. Some examples of antigen preparation include agar-grown versus co-cultivated Bartonella-Hensley bacilli. 
Don't ask me what those mean or what the differences are. There is only so much of this whole science business that I can handle before I have to go back to watching Shaws of Sunset to decompress. IFA tests can also differ depending on what strain of a species is used as the antigen. Dr. Moziani, a Bartonellosis expert and chief medical officer at Galaxy, says in his Lyme book called Lyme Savvy that he researched Bartonellosis tests in 2007 and he found that they sucked. My words, not his. He does say that he gave those existing tests on a scale of 1 to 10 less than a 1. Ouch! He writes that these tests probably used strains of Bartonella that may actually be out of date or vary in their prevalence. Number two, the cutoff titer can affect sensitivity. For example, if a test uses a cutoff titer of 1 to 64, you're going to have a lot more positives than a test that uses 1 to 512 as the cutoff titer. Most IgG IFA tests in the United States use 1 to 64 as the cutoff titer, probably because this provides the best balance between sensitivity, true positives, and specific true negatives. However, even if the same cutoff titer is used, this doesn't mean that two different tests are comparable. For example, if you want to know the serial prevalence of Bartonellosis in California versus New York, you have to use the same test. Number three, according to journal articles I read, there is some subjectivity in the reading of IFA results, and this means that they are subject to inter-observer variation. In other words, two people reading the same patient's tests could get different results. Cool. Different labs have different procedures. As I said in my previous video on best tests for Bartonella, Galaxy requires two readers to agree independently on test results, and they are well trained by Bartonella experts. Sounds pretty damn good to me. Okay, Diasorin or Diasorin? This one says it's Italian. Diasorin. I'm saying Diasorin because it says it's Italian. Industry Biotechnology. Okay. Glad I looked that up. Galaxy has also compared their test antigens to test antigens sold by Diasorin that most big labs use, and the results were pretty comparable. I promise that Galaxy does not pay me to plug them in these videos. No one pays me to do anything in these videos. So back to my story with the ID nurse practitioner. After several weeks of antibiotic therapy, I was already experiencing less pain, which allowed me to do an immense amount of research on Bartonellosis, as you can tell by these videos. I sent her a few key articles by Dr. Brightshort and his colleagues, and she actually had taken the time to read them. She then asked me what antibiotic regimen I was on, and I told her that I was still only on 150 milligrams of rifampin once a day, despite her warnings to never take rifampin by itself. I told her I was freaking out about taking rifampin solo, and she never responded, which really pissed me off at the time, but in all fairness to her, I really wasn't under her care. I then proceeded to work myself up into hysterics, and I convinced myself that I now had a resistant Bartonella infection, and I was screaming and crying on my bed to my mom, and I was waving and flailing my arms like a mad woman, and I hit my hand on my computer, and I cracked my thumbnail in half horizontally. I then proceeded to work myself into even more hysterical hysterics, and I convinced myself that my thumbnail was never gonna grow back. It did. I can laugh about it now, but at the time, it was really not funny. I soon stopped taking the rifampin altogether. Not only was I terrified about a Bartonella infection becoming resistant, but I was also becoming increasingly more reactive to the rifampin, to the point where the gastritis, extreme belching, nerve pain, and lip ulcers became intolerable. And in case you're wondering whether or not it's okay to take rifampin by itself for Bartonellosis, well, don't ask me. Seven months later, and I still don't know the answer. The first doctor to prescribe me antibiotics for my Bartonellosis started me off on rifampin alone. And the second doctor said that that was okay because Bartonella is a slow-growing infection and we could add the second antibiotic later. However, due to my severe mast cell activation, I wasn't able to get past one pill of rifampin, so I certainly wasn't going to be able to add a second antibiotic, not anytime soon. One of the most experienced doctors in treating Bartonellosis adds rifampin in as the second antibiotic, and I don't know how much of that has to do with resistance to rifampin. I do know that rifampin is a very effective drug for Bartonella, and if you add it in second, this gives the patient the opportunity to get the bacterial load down with the first antibiotic before adding such a powerful drug. 
I honestly haven't read that much about rifamycins, the antibiotic class that rifampin belongs to, and bacterial resistance to rifamycins, because it's not that uplifting of a topic and I have lots of other topics to research. I'm not gonna lie, at this point in my illness, I don't always see the light at the end of the tunnel, so I don't really feel like reading about bacterial resistance. What I do know is that bacteria can mutate and become resistant to almost anything, including essential oils and rifamycins in particular. I will put as link number one in the video description box a great overview about rifamycins. Monotherapy with a rifamycin may be used when the bile burden is low, such as in a latent TB infection, but there are still risks with this. So, considering that the most common protocols for putting bartonellosis into remission include two antibiotics, it seems prudent to add the rifampin second. I hope that one day that not only infectious disease doctors will recognize that chronic infections can cause chronic illness, but that all doctors recognize this. This is not such a radical idea, since it is already common knowledge that chronic latent infections exist and can cause illness once the immune system becomes compromised, like in tuberculosis. So many people with chronic bartonellosis have had negative experiences with infectious disease doctors, so I hope that this series of three videos saves you the time, money, and emotional trouble of going to an ID doc. I know that some people will still want to go see an infectious disease doctor after they see these videos, and that some people need to make their own mistakes and learn the hard way. But if you go, afterwards, I'm gonna say I told you so. Please subscribe. Please like. Please. My mom always told me to say please and thank you. So I said that UpToDate says that for a... I said that UpToDate says that for a tighter... So I said that for, and I said that, I said that, <laughs> I didn't say anything, I actually just hung up the phone. <laughs>